Lutheran High students and family and all those others gathered with us here for this sixth uh, Sunday of Easter as we celebrate the resurrection and all that Christ is and all he's making us into through his promises, through his work and word. Uh, This morning, uh, Mr. Kreitz, Mr. Held, we're we're joined with some interesting texts. Uh, these texts start in the book of Acts, and there's a lot of engagement into uh, the excitement of the world and what that means with us. So I'm going to go ahead and get going here. Uh, the first one is a little bit uh, lengthier. It's that Acts 17 text, and uh, everybody at, at Lutheran High, if you've had me for at least one year, has engaged that one then. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead. There might be a couple verses I skip around on, but in Acts 17, we're going to begin where Paul notices the distressed culture that he's in, in verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what's this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. 
Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Now what you worship is something unknown. I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else from one man. He made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. This is a very public moment. This is a little bit different than what we do generally in chapel or in our churches, where we're speaking to people who know the biblical story in general. Uh, This is out in the open. Um, When preaching to these public philosophers, Paul, he's very disturbed by culture, but he engages everybody there with great respect and restraint. Uh, how can we engage, how do you guys say we engage our culture in similar ways today? And uh, where do you see us training our students? Where's the heart and vision of training our students for this eternal engagement that uh, we're sending the seniors off to do here very shortly? I think we're training for more of a small scale engagement. versus mm. this. I don't know if we're, because that's where it is. That's where it's going to begin. Um, I don't know, maybe if we have, some budding, you know, evangelists uh, that, that want to go out like, you know, Billy Graham did or something like that. Maybe we do, you know, but, but I don't know. I think it's going to be the one-on-one, one-on-two, one-on-three groupings and gatherings of that generation that gets together where something comes up and then somebody's going to have to, or should make a defense for what they believe, what they believe. Um, I think it's going to be a smaller engagement, but a bunch of small ones gets you, the same place a big one does eventually. That's my thoughts on it. But but I think we're doing a good job in that intimate engagement training. Yeah, I think what of what we're doing in theology, the department as a whole uh, uh, trains them to be able to see this and be able to uh, talk to it and you know engage um, people in conversation and hopefully come to a, 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 you know, a good resolution. I think it's really interesting. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the god and Greeks. So that tells me that maybe even some of the people that at that time believed in God, loved God, were maybe also engaged in some of these other practices. Would that be fair to say? Or am I reaching too much? It could be, but I don't know that we can verify that 100%. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons, you know, our whole our curriculum changed with the addition of that senior level theology class, because, you know, we're doing a great job with the Old Testament, great job with the New Testament. OK, we got the doctrine done. What do you do with it? Yeah. You know, that that fourth year class is what do you do with it? Yeah. And then how do you make a defense? And, and you know, we weren't we weren't equipping our kids for our students for what to do with this wonderful information that they went through over the three years before they got to their senior year. Fair statement, Pastor, or not? I mean, I. I think that's a fair statement. It wasn't wasn't by design. It was just how we did things. Nobody was right or wrong. It's just we made a conscious decision to go this way with with that curriculum change. Yeah, I think it's a, a much better focus 
of the intent of walking out of here, being ready to engage. Uh, I mean, if we're not distressed by some of the cultural norms uh, by senior year, then then uh, either I haven't done my job or people haven't been listening. But but to engage that in a respectful and winsome way, uh, I'm excited in our senior class this week. They're bringing the ideas and they're going to be the teacher for uh, a few minutes each uh, this week. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what kind of engagement and, and what kind of winsomeness um, specifically on when we put the mantle on their shoulders this week, what that'll look like. Because mostly I've been moderating. I've been uh, starting the conversation. But this week, the seniors are starting it. So it'll be good. Yeah, I sure will. Yeah, and, and we can see, of course, what uh, Paul's doing here. He's commanding everyone to repent and then pointing them right to the man that God has appointed, the man Jesus, of course, by raising him up. And so, again, in this Easter season, that proof, that exclamation point, is uh, is really something that uh, we should all continue uh, continue to engage with and, and be encouraged by. This is what is going to be the make or break uh, for everybody and we've spent a lot of time talking uh, about that in classes, so I sure hope that we can make a defense there. Yeah. Well, great. Peter's certainly a man of action, uh, so why don't we move to First Peter? Yeah, First Peter three, uh, chapter three, beginning at the thirteenth 13, verse. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for the sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, though, though, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand, with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Wow. Yeah, that's that's clear. Yeah. Very, Beautiful. Very clear words of encouragement so uh here here's the part that's maybe not so beautiful suffering is experienced and expected really by everybody you don't have to be christian to suffer in one way shape or form so how do we get through this suffering i know you guys have been through times of suffering how did you get through and where does P peter specifically point us towards I think he points us to the reward that, that awaits us. It's beyond uh, immediate here and now. I had a boss one time that would always remind us when we thought we did something good, he'd always remind us that no, de no good deed ever goes unpunished, and people have probably heard that. But, you know, it was kind of a joke, kind of, you know, being funny about it. But in reality, you think about it, and you really thought, oh, wow, I really did some good work, I really did some good stuff here, then for whatever reason, it, it, it blows up. So, that, so I think it was more or less to, you know, help keep your – your ego and stuff in check. Don't think you're that good because you know, something's going to come it. Or even though that's going to happen, you still did what was right. And, and you did the good thing regardless of the outcome. And, and sometimes more than not, that outcome is not going to be positive. And, but that doesn't, you don't take that in. You let that sit outside and you continue as hard as it is. And this is not easy to continue to march forward and do the good that you were put here to do. And that stuff will sit where it sits, and you just leave it there and move. So that's this is a good encouragement for that. And then obviously, you know, you, if, if all else fails, okay, you think back to your your baptism, and you know, you know that the like the you have a, play, a pledge of good conscience, you know, mm -hmm. through God, a pledge of good conscience. Well, this is the only one that matters. 
Mm-hmm. And of all the pledges we've received that have been failed upon or anything else, but that pledge is solid. Okay, it's never going to go anywhere. So you can fall back on that when times get very bleak. Definitely, yeah. There's there's so much here. The first thing that kind of stuck out with me is just the apologetic nature of both, uh, uh, you know, Paul kind of defending the faith in, you know, in Acts and, and you know, and, and showing them who the unknown God is. And then here Peter is talking about what in verse 15, no, is it? Uh, uh, where it talks about giving, oh yeah, first, first 15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give a reason for the hope that you have. I just think, um, I love how they connect in that way. And then uh, when I look at, uh, you know, f- verse um, 13 and 14, where it says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Uh, it's almost implied, because we're talking about this earlier, but it's almost in it, like implying the second part. Uh, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Guess what? Uh, he 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 finishes with like, you know, should you suffer for what is right? So I'm I'm almost thinking that he was that that it's almost kind of like a rhetorical question, saying that if you you know do go out and do 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 good, it, it you know it'll be easy for you to get. Um, uh, you know, for people not to see it for what it is. And I thought that was kind of um, kind of an interesting way of looking um, at that. Those those two things kind of really stuck out at me in this uh, passage. Yeah, it's, it's filled with tensions, right? And yeah. uh, I just, the one that, as you were going through those uh, verses, uh, Mr. Held, uh, I one thing I noticed prior, right before, the giving an account or the public witness was this spirit of fear or fearfulness maybe. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Peter's clearly saying, don't be afraid, or at least don't fear what they fear. This uh, reminds me or takes me back to what Jesus says. Don't fear the one that can take the body, yes. but do not the soul. Fear the one that after the body dies can then condemn soul into uh, eternal wrath. And punishment, and so there is. It's not that we shouldn't have any uh, fear. There's godly fear. There's respectful fear uh, that is necessary and good, but it shouldn't drive who we are. And uh, when it's time to stand up and say in gentleness and respect what needs to be said, uh, that's that's what we do to the best of our capabilities. And uh, just like what you said, Mr. Kreitz, too. I, it's a beautiful thing that Peter takes us right back to the promises of, of baptism that now saves you. And uh, this removal through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, we have the resurrection of Jesus connected with baptism, just like Paul was uh, uh, teaching and, and preaching in Romans chapter 6, right? That we were buried, therefore, with him and raised to new life. And uh, this is that raising to new life that we're called to, that the world's going to be against. Um, But uh, we don't have to uh, uh, be bashful about it. Uh, God, uh, Jesus is at God's right hand, and he's got all the authority and power in submission to him. So it's going to all work out the way it's supposed to, the way Paul says in Romans 8, 28, eventually, even if it doesn't feel like it right here and now. Yeah, you're probably assured that it won't feel good and comfortable right here and now. But, but down the road, you, you go to that, which is, which is really good, which is really good. Yeah, I hear a lot of people say, well, when God closes one door, he opens another. And even though in general, I don't disagree with that, I'm not sure how I would discern that on the basis of Peter. Right. Because oftentimes I want to run from those moments of, of hardship or difficulty or stress. And I'm often prone to saying, oh, that's when God's closing. It's not working out for me right now. It doesn't feel good for me. So that God must be closing a door here. Therefore, I'm going to look for an open door somewhere else. Well, that might be true. But it might also be true that this is just a, a time of suffering that he's going to walk through with me. And we have those promises as well, that he's going to be with us. In fact, I was just going through the Psalm 23 again, and uh, a passage that I've read so many times, Mr. Held, before, 
and yet I didn't see it exactly this way. Um, the word and it, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That word follow is literally pursue, chase. It's, it's literally as if God is chasing me because of my baptism. And he's bringing his goodness and mercy to me, whether it feels like that or not. Uh, a really uh, a much broader insight that I, I saw from that word there in uh, that psalm that we've heard probably yeah. hundreds, if not more times. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's good, good words of encouragement for all. Definitely. Mr. Hill, you got the gospel today, right? All right. John fourteen fifteen says this. All right. If you love me... <laughs> You will obey what I command. Now ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live. You will also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Well, that's, that's a good gospel. I just, just noticed some now that we just completed the three readings, if you look at this, you have... You have an example in Acts about what's being done. You have both a challenge and a warning, and a little bit of comfort in, in Peter. And then you get to the gospel, the good news, and it's all, I'm going to help you out. You're not alone. You're going to do it together. So, you know, you think about that. You know, that these, these three put together, it's, it's really well, well done in, uh, in having these three come out together in the same lesson, uh, the same Sunday readings, to, if you see it that way. And it just came to me as I looked at this stuff. That's kind you know, of it's beautiful, and uh, I, I know some good guys that can put together their own readings for their series or whatever, uh, but uh, there's a lot of wisdom that went into putting these readings over the centuries and keeping them that way, and uh, I think you hit the nail on the head there, Mr. Kreitz. There's, he's going to be with us always, and, and uh, thank God for the work of the Holy Spirit that when we get a little off track, all right, he's right there in one way, shape, or form, whether word, uh, whether uh, in a, a, a fellowship of the believers, to bring us back and to uh, bring us to that repentant place, which is probably the only thing Luther says we do really well. The other things, we may get close to the bullseye occasionally, but uh, but that repentance part, that's that's the true goodness. So. Well, if we're honest, we have a lot of practice in it, so we should be good at that. You know, <laughs> if we're honest ourselves, we practice it often. But, but no, it's it's really neat that, like I said, that gospel is the gospel is always, you know, comforting, and it's it's kind of neat as we come up. You know, Easter's not behind us yet, but as we look forward mm -hmm. to Pentecost and and you know when the Holy Spirit does descend and 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 you know Jesus leaves and and then He does what He says He's going to do, he gives Him he gives Him that. That's when it really, really starts taking off, and so, he, so he never really left them alone. You know, what I mean, he doesn't leave us alone. You know, you're never really alone. All these examples tie together. You're not alone. So, even though it feels like at times, <laughs> but you're not alone. So, very interesting. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really struck. I'm, I'm, I'm really struck by that first verse again. You know, you read something so many times and. Here it just has new meaning, but it says, if you love me, you will obey my uh, command, you know, and it just, you know, so if you love me, you're going to do what I say. And it's such a powerful statement because, you know, we sing songs about loving God. We sing songs about obedience, especially a lot of the newer praise songs and stuff. It's all about loving God and this and that. Um, but here, you know, we're just reminded <laughs> if you love, you have to listen. To what I say and that's that's not always easy I mean like when you think about it, it it's, it's gosh it might even be be scarier than than talking to Epicurean and Stoic philosophers you know about 
of, about faith, just listening and doing what God says, you know? Uh, it might be scarier than going out and witnessing to someone just to do what God says, because sometimes uh, that is stepping out of our, our, our comfort zone. Yeah, faith walk is is always the challenge, uh, and it's a challenge on a number of ways. But most of what I hear, uh, the uh, saints that have gone before us, the ones that um, the ones that talked about having that deep connection and relationship with God started their day on their knees, and it was in their devotional life that uh, you're just in a more receptive. Uh, attitude when you're on your knees, right? If I'm standing up or taking my stand, there's probably not nearly as much listening going on. But if I'm down on my knees, if I understand uh, the humble spot that I that I can have on this uh, on this you know planet, then I'm probably much more apt to hear. But then again, what do I really want to hear? What God's showing me through His law, that mirror that staring back at, uh, at me in my face. And, and that's a tough one, which probably drives me back to my knees. Right. And eventually with enough, with enough of that practice, maybe we start to hear and trust. Um, sometimes the school of hard knocks helps a little bit. Sure does. Yeah, this is, this is a good, good, good three texts together. I think, you know, as we, as we go through troubled times now, with everything around, these are these are things we're up against, and you never know where we're going to have to have an opportunity to explain to somebody, you know, how did this all happen? A lot of it we don't have answers to, you know, we, but we probably never will. Um, I mean, when I say how does it happen, how does God let that, this happen? I mean, that's mm-hmm. a question that comes up, but we have to just go back to what where our hope resides and where our you know goes, and where better things are ahead of us, and and we have an opportunity in this. Maybe maybe in this case, the obstacle that we're up against is actually the way through. And we're, we stay in this obstacle, we bounce against this thing, it hurts, it's terrible, but it's going to be the way through. And on the other side of it, it by going through it, instead of trying to find a way around, up or over, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help us be better in what we're doing. So, yeah. One thing that struck me from the gospel specifically that seems countercultural is uh, the call to unity through the Holy Spirit, the sameness of... I'm reminded as I remember my failing over the week, and yet in a normal, in a normal week, as I, as uh, we, as we worship in our church fellowships, we we all come together up to the rail of God, up to the altar of God, in our repentant attitudes to receive our and even the presence of Jesus Christ um, for that for that togetherness and. Uh, then he sends us out with his benediction, but that's so countercultural. I mean, our culture couldn't be more about celebrating diversity. What a what a tension to be in as Christians, where we're maybe unique in certain aspects, but we're also brought to a sameness, a unity that humbles us. And uh, I don't know, that might be an opportunity for us to witness uh, to the surrounding culture that's very much celebrating diversity and an overabundance of uniqueness. Yeah, I almost feel that this diversity is, it's almost like it's a, almost really so, like so, a celebration of like rebellion, because mm. that's really what it comes down to, because it's, I want to do what I want to do, you can't tell me what to do, that's what we're celebrating, you know, and if you tell me that I can't celebrate this, that I can't be this way, that means that we are not friends, you know? And that's, um, and but but in Christ, you know, we surrender ourselves instead of uh, rebellion, it's it's obedience. And we, you know, and we follow uh, God uh, in that direction and in, in that sameness. Well, can you guys think of any uh, specific sameness in your church uh, uh, other than the one that I talked about, the, the repentance and uh, all going up to the altar in spite of having very different and unique people uh, in, in your fellowships? Well, we all come together for a common, uh, under a common theme. Yeah. I was going to say under a common roof. Yeah, no kidding. But under a common theme of what we're there for. 
you know, we're there on Church of Sunday, not not to show what we're going to give. We're there to receive. Mm-hmm. We come to there, and then that's how at least the church service I attend every Sunday it begins with the fact that this is this is what God's gift to you, this service, and this is all for you. And you just change your own mindset, and then take it all in, and and that's really really good. And then respond accordingly. So. Yeah. I always love the confession and absolution because that's a moment, you know, we, you know, we have different things going on in our lives, but for that one moment, you know, when we confess our sins and, we're, you know, we're all on that one page, we're being, uh, you know, we're confessing where we've been wrong and asking God just, just to forgive us. To me, that's a really neat uh, place as a congregation to see a lot of people at the same time do, do that just blows my mind. My favorite mm-hmm. part, part of our service. Well, thank you, men, for uh, all of your uh, considerations and thoughtfulness and putting these three scriptures together. I think the guys that did that way long time ago, they knew what they were doing. And uh, why don't we uh, finish together with that very thing, Mr. Held, uh, uh, a confession and an opportunity for God to do his work in our midst. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for these three readings that we were able to focus on today because of your word and your power and especially your Holy Spirit, help us to take in the directives. We know they're faith steps. We haven't always been faithful. Help us to see in in St. Paul uh, the opportunities before us, whether with a friend or a future, future children or co-workers, and uh, encourage them with gentleness and respect to know that you are that man, Jesus Christ, that came and put on our sin so that you could place upon us your righteousness. Help us to communicate that in ways that are winsome and loving and help us to know that you are always with us. Father, I admit that I haven't always remembered that. I haven't always leaned upon you and your clear word as I should for that We come before you humbly and ask for your forgiveness and renewal. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Whole family, uh, Lutheran High family and all those gathered with us, if you've ever had moments of failure, whether it's in heeding the directives of God, a clear word of God, and communicating that word, and or, or maybe just having moments of anxiety where you, you don't know where everything's going, please understand you're not alone. Uh, There have been many that have come before us that needed the reminder of God's presence. And this is one of the ways God has always done that. He has responded in those times and moments of need with his forgiving attitude and heart. Just like the prodigal father ran out to his son, didn't even let him get done with communicating his uh, confession before he put the ring on his feet, the robe of righteousness upon him. Uh, and uh, sandals on his feet. And so hear these words, because God loves you, and he always welcomes you back in because of his gracious mercy and power. Those things that you confess in your heart, know that God has heard those things, and he already knew them ahead of time. He loves you, and he forgives you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Mr. Kreitz. Yes, well, Students and, and families were, were there about two weeks left, a little over two weeks left. A lot of work was done this past week. Some, some tough decisions were made. A lot of communications were out. But I can assure you that in the discussions with the board of directors and the discussions that were there, the welfare of our students was always at the forefront of what we need to do and, and always what we can do and be compliant. And so there's a lot of communications coming out, but we also have to remember that we are going through with the things that we normally do just in a different format, but we still get to do the favorite times of the year where, you know, we get to honor the best of our best at our awards night. We also have a very special moment with the senior chapel. We also will have a baccalaureate message a little bit different than what we're used to, but we'll still have the, 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 the commissioning and the sermon and the, and the scriptures there. And then we're going to finish it up with our with a, a, a drive through. I hate, hate to sound so bad, but it's the best I can do with it. Drive through commencement where we actually put our seniors on stage. They always always are on stage in our hearts, but they're going to be on stage publicly. At least have their moment in the sun that they worked so hard. So 
please continue to pay attention to the communications that come through email. It's the easiest way to communicate and stay the course. For all the other students, finish strong because you want to advance your next grade and, and take all you can from this grade as you move to the next. But we look forward to uh, seeing you, at least some of you, very few of you, on, on May 30th, but we'll continue to connect through these means and through the, the videos that are coming. So everybody have a good week and stay safe. We'll talk to you soon. Have a blessed week in the Lord until we meet again.